Hello and welcome to the West Block. Happy Thanksgiving to you, but we recognize that this is a difficult Thanksgiving for Canadians across the country this weekend as we are facing record high numbers of COVID-19 cases, the highest yet in the pandemic. Major cities in Quebec and Ontario are moving back into partial lockdowns with bars, restaurants and gyms closed as well as other businesses. On Friday, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau warned that the skyrocketing COVID numbers are ringing alarm bells. We're at a tipping point in this pandemic. Not only is the second wave underway, yesterday we hit the highest daily recorded cases, well above what we saw this spring. I know this is discouraging, especially going into Thanksgiving weekend. But remember this, when things were at their bleakest during the first wave, Canadians pulled together and flattened the curve. While the lockdowns in this round are more targeted, they will still hurt already hard-hit businesses. On Friday, the Liberal government announced a suite of programs to help businesses hanging on by the skin of their teeth. They include commercial rent supports that businesses can access directly and an extension on the wage subsidy. It all leaves us with a lot of questions, questions about COVID-19, and we wanted to talk to somebody who has the answers, not partisan answers, but scientific answers. And that's Dr. Mona Nimer. She is the chief science advisor to the government of Canada. I sat down with her last week to talk about COVID-19, what we know, what the second wave will look like, and what it all means for our healthcare system. Here's that interview. Dr. Niemer, thank you so much for making time for us today. I know you're incredibly busy on all these different COVID committees. A lot of Canadians today are looking at the rising case numbers and and as they look at them, 2,000 a day or more, and we prepare for the second wave, what do you think the second wave is going to look like? What are you hearing from scientists about what we should expect? Well, you know, the second wave is going to look what we are going to make it uh, look like, meaning through our actions and uh, and what we do, because I think that we have everything in hand uh, to make sure that the second wave is actually uh, smaller uh, and uh, shorter than uh, than the first wave. It's a matter of uh, following public health uh, guidance. What happens if people don't listen to that public health advice, if they continue to gather? I mean, it's Thanksgiving weekend, lots of people wanting to get together with friends and family. What are the consequences potentially of that? Well, look, we just need to look ar- around uh, the world uh, in places where they, they, they had uh, the first and second waves and uh, it's just going to keep uh, keep going up and we're going to be in uh, back in lockdown and uh, nobody nobody wants that. So I really uh, urge everyone to please make those small sacrifices uh, so that we can continue at least to be able to uh, see each other's and uh, um, you know, not be locked down and uh, unable to uh, have a minimum of, uh, you know, socializing. How far out do you think a vaccine is then? And how realistic is that as a solution for a life to go back as we knew it pre-pandemic? Well, well there are a few vaccines that have uh, have gone through the, the, the early clinical phases that assess their safety and their uh, efficacy at generating an immune response. So we know that that happens, that we have vaccines that are safe and we have vaccines that are able to generate in healthy individuals an immune response. I think what we're still waiting to find out is whether you know vaccination is going to prevent infection or is going to prevent severe disease in infected individuals. So the, the, the timelines for this uh, you know, it's the coming two months. And uh, I think a number of, uh, of uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, have published actually the protocols of their uh, more advanced uh, clinical trials. So we should have an answer by the end of the year, whether we have an effective vaccines against the infection or not. And then after that, I think the, you know, vaccination will be able to start as early as uh, the beginning of uh, uh, 2021. This is a government that has repeatedly said, the the Trudeau government federally, that they listen to scientists and they make evidence-based policy. Has your experience been that the Prime Minister and his government are making policy decisions based on the evidence and based on the science? 
Well, you know, I can tell you that for, you know, the things that uh, that uh, we have provided uh, advice on, uh, I am, uh, I am uh, uh, very satisfied that uh, they are listening to the science and that, you know, as as it evolves as well. Um, I think it's, uh, it's also important to realize that, uh, uh, you know, there are uh, shared responsibilities between many levels of governments in terms of the, of the, uh, of the of the pandemic, and I say this not to you know uh, put blame on on anybody, but it's it's just that there is so much you know one level of government can do, and I think that this is a situation where everybody needs to work together and uh, to listen to this to, to the science, but uh, but also to uh, you know there are trade offs. Science is not an absolute. There are trade offs, and the trade offs very much depend on. Uh, you know, um, local, regional um, considerations as well. What are your thoughts on the role of China in all this? Because there's been a debate. Uh, the WHO even has now said that the Chinese were not as forthcoming as they should have been with the information and with the data. You, know, you were there, you were receiving that intelligence. Do you think that China was transparent about what was going on and the potential severity of this virus? You know, look, it's it's difficult to answer the question because you know, at at one point we start we started certainly hearing about the cases. They sequenced the virus. They made the sequence available. Now the question is, did you know was this happening for like a month before they talked about it? Uh, you know, is something that I really can can comment on um, because I, I I simply don't know. Is there still any risk of our healthcare system being overwhelmed by COVID in this second wave? It's possible. Uh, uh, you know what what hospitals are uh, in, in in certain uh, regions are uh, you know at uh, above hundred percent capacity in the in uh, in emergency in emergency rooms uh, already with the non uh, COVID uh, cases. Um, what we did you know previously is we. Uh, we stopped a, a lot of uh, a lot of care that is non-COVID, and we have waiting lists that we need to go through because, uh, you know, while we're getting uh, while COVID is uh, with us, uh, unfortunately, other diseases are as well, uh, and we can't just like put them on on pause. So uh, there is a, a possibility that if uh, we have to deal with huge cases of uh, of, uh, of COVID-19 that we will overwhelm uh, the system. And I would hate for this to happen, you know, in, in Canada and to have to uh, put people again on waiting lists who need cancer treatment and who need, you know, cardiac surgery. Dr. Niemer, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. We truly appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. Up next, COVID and the court system. Justice Minister David Lametti joins us to talk about court delays and the potential return of ISIS fighters to Canada. All of our lives have changed drastically due to COVID-19, whether it's going to work, grocery shopping, or seeing loved ones. Coronavirus has fundamentally changed the way we do things, and the courts are no exception to that. Joining me now to talk about this is Justice Minister and Attorney General of Canada, David Lametti. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving, Minister. And same to you. It's a pleasure to be here. Sir, there are so many unintended consequences and effects of COVID-19, and one of those has been delays on the court system. Can you walk us through what effect COVID-19 has had on the courts from your perspective? Well, the, the, the effects have been multiple uh, in terms of the way a court can hear when it's an in-person session. Uh, if there's a jury trial, how do you space the jury? How do you empanel the jury in a safe way? Uh, how do you make sure that everybody who walks into that court building from uh, participants in the, in the process, so the parties to a case, to the lawyers, to the judges, to the support staff, you have to make sure that the whole thing is functioning uh, in a safe uh, manner that that protects people inside from uh, having the from getting the virus from the propagation of the virus. So all of that is is in play. Um, 
And then there's the impact that it has on the case that itself. Uh, initially, the courts slowed down uh, or stopped in some cases, depending on the courts across Canada. Uh, and, and so there have, been, uh, there have been delays. We have been working from the beginning um, with my provincial and territorial counterparts uh, and ministers of justice, but also with the courts. I co-chair a, a committee with the Chief Justice of Canada, Richard Wagner, and we have been working with other chief justices and other uh, judicial administrators across Canada to make sure that the courts can function. There is a decision by the Supreme Court that's well known as the Jordan decision, and it basically said people have a right to a trial within what would be considered a reasonable amount of time. Are you seeing a lot of challenges due to delayed trials, delayed court proceedings under the Jordan decision that could see very serious charges like murder being thrown out? Well, it's important to underline that within the Jordan decision itself, there is a, a, a provision made for exceptional circumstances. Uh, I think by any, any definition that, or any interpretation that one could have of the Jordan decision, this pandemic is an exceptional circumstance and therefore is a factor that a court uh, has to weigh when assessing uh, the question of unreasonable delay. So, so far, the, the situation we feel is under control. We're watching it very carefully watching it with my provincial and territorial counterparts as well as with uh, as with uh, the judges uh, who are administering the court system across Canada, the chief justices across Canada. So far we're watching. Uh, we are in constant uh, communication uh, with uh, people administering the court system um, and for the time being uh, we're satisfied that things are, are moving are moving well uh, but we'll continue uh, and we'll act uh, if necessary we'll act immediately should you start that legislation now so that it's ready to go well, as I said, the, the exceptional circumstances provision is within uh, is is uh, framed within the Jordan uh, decision itself, uh, and so far, uh, courts and and counsel and all participants in the system are taking that that uh, principle seriously. Uh, this is an exceptional circumstance, and and we're confident that it will be factored into decision making. Minister, I wanted to ask you about something remarkable that we've seen over the past few weeks, and that seems to be a shift when it comes to dealing uh, with Canadians who fought for ISIS or the children of those Canadians. In particular, we have finally seen two people who are alleged to have supported and fought with ISIS overseas charged here in Canada. For years, we heard from prosecutors in the RCMP they couldn't lay charges because they just couldn't get enough evidence. Has something changed now in the way that the law is applied so you're able to actually prosecute people who are facing these allegations or have you been able to somehow access this evidence? Well, look, let me begin by saying that we, we take uh, terrorism charges very seriously. We take the question of uh, foreign travelers or travelers who travel for, for terrorist purposes very seriously. And we acknowledge that the, the challenge of getting battlefield evidence. Within our prosecution service, um, we have prosecutors who are dedicated to prosecuting terrorism charges. Uh, and so we, we have taken it seriously uh, from the get-go. I don't think there's been a change in that regard. Um, but there are, there are questions of evidence and we leave it up to our prosecutors and our police investigators, our police investigators working with our allies to gather that evidence and we leave it up to our prosecutors uh, to assess when they have uh, when they have enough evidence to move forward with these kinds of charges and that's clearly what they've done here. At the beginning of last week, uh, a little girl was brought home from Syria. She was a Canadian citizen, uh, the child of two individuals who were fighting for ISIS. She was orphaned, uh, brought back out of Syria and into Iraq by Canadian Special Operations Forces. There's been a big debate about bringing home, in particular, the children uh, of those who were fighting. Is this the beginning of a change there as well, Minister, where we might see more people coming home? Or if we're now able to charge ISIS fighters, seeing some of those ISIS fighters in the Kurdish camps being brought home as well. Well, look, this was a fairly unique situation uh, that required a, a compassionate response. And I'm really proud uh, of the fact that our government did respond compassionately. And I would thank all the special forces and Canadian Armed Forces uh, and, and other, uh, other uh, 
Canadian administrators uh, and, and officials who made this happen. This was a this was a, a, a young girl who lost her whole family and had family in Canada, and the family in Canada wanted to bring her back uh, so that so that they could raise her. So again, fairly. Um, a uh, fairly unique set of circumstances. Uh, if if children are there with their parents, uh, at, at, then then that is a decision that that's been made in that family, uh, and so it, it's a completely different set of circumstances. Um, and we had the opportunity to repatriate uh, this young girl uh, safely and securely. So I, I think it's fair to say that this was a, a fairly unique set of circumstances. On COVID-19, as we see the case numbers ramping back up across Canada, uh, I think back to the spring when we saw provinces essentially set up their own borders and start preventing interprovincial travel. Are you at all concerned about that as the Justice Minister and the Attorney General in terms of the precedent that it sets constitutionally to allow provinces to determine their own bound, uh, boundaries and borders and who can come in and out? Well, look, I've sat on that on the COVID committee uh, as uh, justice minister and attorney general from the beginning, uh, so I've participated in all of all of those decisions uh, from the beginning. That's certainly a situation that we're monitoring. Obviously, there are uh, rights to movement uh, guaranteed by the Canadian Charter. But that being said, this is a pandemic, uh, and there are there are certain measures. Um, that that might be tolerated in a pandemic uh, temporarily uh, in order to help fight the disease. So we will uh, for fight the virus. So we'll continue to monitor that situation uh, and uh, as we move forward. One last question. You have assisted dying legislation that has to be passed by December that will expand those who qualify uh, for assisted dying. This, of course, came as a result of a court challenge in Quebec. Are you confident that you can meet that deadline, sir? Yes, I think I think we can. There's a widespread consensus across Canada. We 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 we. Uh, held consultations across Canada with experts, with people who've gone through the process, with, with maid service providers, um, as well as with Canadians online. Over 300,000 people participated. There, are, there is a widespread uh, consensus for the, the modifications that we're proposing. And I would call on all parliament, parliamentarians in both houses of parliament, but across all the aisles, uh, to work together to get this to the finish line uh, so that uh, we get this uh, legislation passed by the 18th of December. Minister Lametti, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful long weekend. Pleasure being here. Happy Thanksgiving to all of your viewers. Up next, it's International Day of the Girl. Former Conservative leader Rana Ambrose is here to talk about women in politics. She'll also be touching on what's happening south of the border with President Trump, trade threats to Canada, and more. You're watching the West Block on Global. COVID-19 has been a challenge for every Canadian, but research shows that the pandemic may be hitting women and girls particularly hard. On this International Day of the Girl, we are joined by former interim Conservative leader Rana Ambrose, who has just released a children's book telling the story of experiences of girls all around the world. It's great to speak to you again. Thanks for coming on, Ms. Ambrose. Thanks for having me and happy International Day of the Girl. One of your biggest legacies, I think, uh, here on Parliament Hill was the introduction of legislation that required judges to be educated when it comes to sexual assault. Do you think that there have been changes in the justice system and on Parliament Hill? Uh, are women making progress? I think we are making progress. Uh, I. There were, I've spent a lot of time advocating for that bill. The bill has been reintroduced again by the Justice Minister of Canada in the last couple of weeks. It is in Parliament, and I expect that it will pass. Third time a charm. Uh, but it, because of that, that advocacy, we do have now uh, at least tra comprehensive training in place for judges. It's not mandatory, and it's not for all of them, but it is available, and that's a big step forward. We also saw PEI introduce a similar bill and Saskatchewan also move on it and we hope other provinces will come on board. My hope is that at some point we have a lot more faith in our justice system for survivors of sexual assault 
Uh, you probably know the numbers, Mercedes. One in three women in Canada will experience some sort of sexual violence, but one in 10, only one in 10 will report it, and they'll say it's because they have no faith in the court system. Uh, and so we need to create that faith, and we need more women to be able to feel comfortable coming forward to tell their story and to seek justice. And so that's what the bill is about, is making sure that those people right at the top um, are the ones that know the law best and that are going to uh, manage their courtrooms in a way that we don't see the kind of language we've seen in the past, like telling a girl to keep her legs together. Um, you know, why didn't she keep her knees together when she was raped? Uh, and, you know, really putting a lot on the victims. So let's hope it passes. This is the third time it's been through the House of Commons. Ms. Ambrose, you're also a former Minister of Health. Uh, when you're looking at what's happening right now as large parts of the country are going back into partial shutdowns, rising COVID numbers, what are your thoughts on, on what the government needs to do to get through this? Well, I mean, a lot, I think at the federal level, we need to support people economically, and that has happened. Now, of course, we're all worried about the amount of spending going out the door. The spending is necessary. At some point, we have to see past this COVID uh, emergency and what comes next and we have to think about that bottom line and the debt that we are collecting on the other hand it's provinces that deal with provincial it deal with health care I think what provinces the provinces that have got it right are the ones that have really raised their testing capacity have really brought on a lot of testing uh, in the last six months since COVID hit and provinces that haven't been able to do that are really suffering and and that's too bad and I hope that we can see more testing ramp up Look, we can't keep kids in school. We can't send people back to the workplace. We can't keep daycares open if we don't have a good testing regime. And waiting in line for eight hours is not a good testing regime. You're out in Alberta, and there's certainly been some tension between Premier Jason Kenney and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, we learned on Friday there's some money coming for infrastructure for Alberta, but there's been no sectoral support for oil and gas. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's really tough to see because look it's great to have infrastructure funding we'll take all the support we need but i mean just last week another 2000 albertans lost their jobs we have over a hundred thousand people out of work with no uh, you know no work in sight because you know the the issues that we're dealing with here are not just uh the fact that we're we're dealing with low oil prices because of the pandemic hitting and and the demand going down but we're also dealing with policies coming out of the federal government that are very very hurtful to the oil and gas sector and at the end of the day uh, the industry will be the first ones to put up their hand and say look we want to be climate leaders we are investing multi-millions of dollars to be better climate leaders we want to make sure that we're part of a strategy to reduce emissions but the government has got to work with industry to make this happen. They've got to work hand in hand. They can't just announce one day that they're, you know, they're bringing in place uh, another carbon tax, which is the what the clean fuel standard basically is, without consulting with industry. Ms. Ambrose, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Thanks, Mercedes. And that's all the time that we have for today. Don't forget to tune in to the West Block podcast for exclusive content and bonus episodes this week. I'll be back here next Sunday. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend and take care. <music>